Hey everybody, Ed Homewood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. Hope everyone's doing well today. Today we're gonna to talk about this little box from Fozzy Audio that really changed my mind about a couple of things. It was really interesting. Sit back, relax, and we're gonna talk about the Fozzy Audio ZD3 Balanced DAC slash preamp. So what is the Fozzy Audio ZD3? Well, it's a balanced DAC that can also be a preamp and it has a defeatable preamp function. It's $180. It has really changed a lot of things for me and I'm gonna talk about it later in the video. It uses an ESS 9039 Q2M DAC chip. Um, it does use a really good XMOS processor. You can roll op amps in. If you go to the Fozzy website, you'll see they list, and I'll put it down here, the picture. They've got all different kinds of op amps that you can purchase directly from them, including Sparkos, although buy the Sparkos from Andrew's website. Anyway, it is uh, on USB, it will do 32768 and DST 512. On SPDIF, it will do 24190, excuse me, 24192. It does have XLR balance, full balance outputs, um, and single ended. It has uh, USB in. Uh, coax in, optical in, has an HDMI arc in, which is a really nice thing. It does do Bluetooth. I don't have the antenna on it right now. Um, it measures very well. I think Audio Science Review gave it an excellent rating. It's a really well-built very nice piece. Um, does It has a lot of great functions. Good remote control, easy to use. The display is a little bit challenging to see from a distance, but you know, once you get it set up, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty simple, um, and you know, very well constructed. And again, for 180 bucks, I think it's really a good deal. So let me show you the kind of the front panel of it. And I know it's going to be a little bit hard to see. The wheel, I'll get the glare off. The wheel controls volume. You can push it and it changes input signals, those kinds of things. On the back side, very typical, balanced out, of course, single ended, coax, SPDIF, HDMI arc, uh, USB B, and the Bluetooth, and of course, uh, 12, volt vo uh, 12 volt power in. And I imagine you could use a linear power supply with it. One thing I did like about it is the manual system is real simple. I'm not a big fan of all of these tone colors and sound flavors and EQ settings and DACs. Honestly, it is almost next to impossible to hear a difference with those. This is just really simple, really well laid out. And as I'll tell you later, it really impressed me a lot. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to put it on the bench. We're going to open it up. Let's talk about swapping op amps. Okay, as we're prepping to disassemble the ZD3, um, you'll need a 1.5, and I'm not sure exactly what the measurement is, but it, on the little kit it says 1.5, and this is 2.0, and the 1.5 is for the little switch on the bottom. You would, I do recommend getting an op amp or an IC puller. I got this on Amazon, very inexpensive little kit that came with a bunch of stuff. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna flip this over and we're gonna undo the screws on the bottom for the preamp bypass switch. And this will come back later to haunt us because as I undo these screws, you'll see the switch will start to fall into the chassis because there's really nothing holding it in and you gotta move it out of the way, get it out of that slot. So as I do this, that switch will start to fall down in that chassis. I just have to keep spinning it and then kind of knock that screw out. So that's done. Then we're gonna take the knob off and that requires a 10 millimeter socket. Give me one second to get the knob off. It's on there nice and tight, which is good. Once you get the knob off, you'll need a 10 millimeter socket. I use a deep well. I just got these online really inexpensively to undo that nut around the volume control. And you can just spin that off. And then that and the washer will come right off. Now on the back side, we've got two screws we need to undo here and here. And that takes the two, whatever unit of measurement that is, and we just undo those. So I'm going to come back after I get it all done. All right, I've got those two screws out in the back and the faceplate will actually just pull right off and you'll see the standoffs that are, you know, the, the things in the back screw into. We're going to set that aside. And then the actual circuit board comes out from the rear like that. And there we are. We're looking at the inside of the ZD3. And there are your op amps. Let me zoom in on that for you a little bit. And I apologize if my camera work stinks because I'm not a great camera guy. But anyway, there are our op amps. Now those are the stock op amps. And as you can see on the 
workbench, I've got a lot of other op amps here. I've got tons. I've got some NOS stuff. I've got the extra three that came in the box with it. I've got some OPA 1656s. I've got some Bursons. And I've got those uh, SB or SX52Bs I bought on AliExpress. So what we want to do is, well, this will be all cut together and I apologize for that. So there are your op amps already installed in the board. Now, what you want to do is you want to get yourself this little op amp tiller, as I mentioned, I got it on Amazon very inexpensively and it's got little hooks underneath. So what you want to do is you want to grab the op amp underneath between the chip and the socket and just give it a firm pull and the op amps will come right out. So very, very simple. Be careful with those because the pins on these are very delicate and they bend super easy and so we just want to pull those out so again very very simple so now when you're rolling op amps what you want to do is you notice there's a notch in the socket there and on the dip eights which i like to use there's a notch on it but if you look at the original op amps that were in here there's no notch on the chip like there is a notch on this chip see how it's got a little notch right there See that little notch? It matches the notch in the socket. Well, the OEM chips don't have a notch, but they've got a little dot. I don't know if you can see that little dot, it's shiny. That is chip, that's pin one, and that goes toward the notch in the socket. So I use these uh, SX52Bs, I really like that. The notch is printed on the bottom of the little circuit board, and you go notch to notch, and you just plug it right in. And it's very, very simple, notch, notch. Gets a little crowded. You can see it's a little close right in there. And then notch, notch. And we've rolled our op amps. So now the one thing is when we put it back together, this is loose and this will be a bit of a pain in the neck. And I don't know why they designed it that way, but they did. So I'm gonna go ahead and get it partially reassembled. And then when we get to the switch part, we'll talk about it. So as you reassemble it, the board goes back in from the back of the chassis itself and it kind of clicks in and then the faceplate will go on, but the switch will be a real pain in the neck and you just kind of have to fuddle, futz with it until you get the little switch in there and you can get some screws in. So I'm going to go ahead and finish the, the reassembly of this and we'll talk, go in the studio and talk about how it sounds. Well, as you can see, other than that pesky little preamp defeat switch on the bottom of this, it's not too bad rolling op amps in this, and I did. And I listened to it for a while with the, the stock LMEs. I listened to it for a while with the optional that came in the box, the JRC45800s, um, and they were good. Um, I did put in OPA, TI OPA 1656s. I only had a single Sparkos 3602 because there were, all my other ones are installed in other stuff, and I did run it on single-ended. So I did use it balanced and single-ended. I used it balanced on a Cambridge Evo 150 because that of the stuff that I have here right now that was the only one with a balanced input but most of the time I listened to it on single-ended and most of the time for the review session I listened to it with the LMEs probably 30% of the time but for the balance of it I used those SX52Bs that I got off of AliExpress that very much like a, a 3602 Sparkos or a 1656 Ti um, in that it's a solid state op amp there was something about that combination. There was a synergy there with those op amps in this DAC that was really engaging and it pulled me in. So I listened to it primarily. I did, I, you know, balanced on the Evo 150 with the big Wharfdale diamonds. I used it single-ended on the Galleon TS120 SE tube amp, but for the lion's share of it was going single-ended out with the SX52Bs going into the Black Ice F52 and again into the big Wharfdales. And it, again, being a source first guy, this the only job this has to do is to decode the ones and zeros accurately uh, and cleanly and impart no sonic signature of its own and it got close to doing this i think this has got a little bit of a signature i think this has got a little bit of bass little extra bass built into it which i really really liked a lot and it, maybe it's the the i heard it a little bit with the lmes um i definitely heard it with the sx52bs and the sparkos 3602s or 3602 but this has got i think a little bit of extra sauce in the bass and whatever Fozzie did with the circuitry on this Again, this is the first ESS Sabre DAC that I didn't go and cringe at because if there was some Sabre glare in there, you know what? 
I don't know that I could honestly detect it. Um, I think so much of the sound quality of anything is the quality of the recording you put in. And to that end, I tried to use really, really good recordings to really kind of suss out what, what's going on in here. And my determination is this is actually pretty good. And hopefully you guys might determine that this video is pretty good and you'd be willing to give me a like and a subscribe. As I said, at 179 bucks, 180 bucks for this thing, it's a big recommendation to me for me. So how did I use it again? I fed it Artivana USB um, and I did controversial go into the SMSL DDC and there was a difference, but I didn't use it for my real critical reviewing. I did also feed it from the Shanling uh, CD transport that I have, the $800 CD transport I have via USB because that's got a USB out and that's really cool. And that was really, really good combination. We're going to talk more about the Shanling later when I get to the review of it. This thing surprised me. It engaged me. It, it really took me by surprise. Um, I, I didn't expect, I didn't expect to, to enjoy it as much as I did just because of my kind of predisposition, you know, dislike of saber decks. Something's going on in there. Something special is going on in there. So some of the standout recordings I use in the albums I'm going to recommend to you today are Aretha Franklin, Lady Soul. Oh my gosh, this is one of the most absolutely phenomenal recordings of any kind uh, of ever. Just amazing. This is her, her sophomore album with Atlantic Records. It's her second album with producer Jerry Wexler. But prior to that, I think she was at Columbia. And prior to that, Columbia just kind of was... They were trying to put a, a round peg in a square hole. Aretha came up through gospel and she has that soul and that texture and that gospel energy in her voice. And Columbia's got her doing, and excuse the expression, and I'm not trying to be controversial. They got her doing kind of white bread pop 60s stuff that you'd hear from like, you know, Jerry Vale or, or Frank Sinatra or whatever. That's not in her wheelhouse. She is a soul singer. And when she got to Atlantic, they cut her loose. They let her do her stuff. And just amazing. So on Lady Soul, the opening track grabs you right by the scruff of the neck, chain of fools, and just pulls you in. It's such an amazing recording. Now, the cool thing about this is it was recorded in, in probably summer of 67 in Muscle Shoals, Alabama at Muscle Shoals at the famous recording studio. You may remember Leonard Skinner refers to it in Sweet Home Alabama. He talks about Muscle Shoals and the Swampers. Well, the Swampers are the session musicians at the Muscle Shoals recording studio, and they appear on Chain of Fools. And actually at opening guitar riff was one of the swampers just noodling around on a detuned guitar and everybody went wait a minute there's something there and they grabbed it and they put it in the song just amazing she's got her sisters i think her sisters are the impressionists her backup singers and it's just a wonderful wonderful track i mean it is a staggeringly good song and it was a, a hit still a hit for her for many many years and then the rest of the sessions were done pretty much late in 1967 up in new york city and again you know she did the song, You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman. That was co-written by Carol King, written specifically for Aretha Franklin. Just an amazing track. She takes that song. It's hers. She made it her own. She owns that song forever. Even though Carol King did cover it on her Tapestry album, it's Aretha's song without any question about it. Now, she did do a song, and it escapes me momentarily from Otis Redding, and I'll put the title of it down here. Just amazing. And these sessions in New York were wonderful, just energetic and wonderfully recorded, and some great people sneaking in on the recording. Bobby Womack appears on, on part of this recording, and Eric Clapton played guitar on this recording as well. And, of course, in 67, late 67, he's full into the cream thing and just at the top of his game with that. Wonderful recording. L Lady Soul, just absolutely staggering. It, it set her up as the superstar she always should have been and always remained to be. Just remarkable. Aretha's just, what a voice, what an album. You'll love it. You'll, it'll make you want to listen to more Aretha Franklin stuff. The next album is a recent discovery for me. It actually came out in September 2024, and it took me by surprise. David Gilmore, Luck and Strange. Um, this is a really unique album. It's only his fifth solo album in, in 46 years. His, his first solo album was 1978. It's only his fifth solo album. And it is an interesting, amazing, I think emotional, um, very kind of cathartic album for him. I, I'm, and I'm only guessing. Um, and I'll talk about why I think that uh, after I kind of give you an idea of the album. 
Luck and Strange is unique. Um, it is, most of the songs were written by his wife, Polly Sampson, and his daughter, Romney, uh, sings lead on two of the songs, and she does a duet with her dad on uh, Yes, I Have Ghosts, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. This is excellent. His voice, obviously, is not like it was when he was younger. It is textured and nuanced, and it's got a bit of that world, not world weariness, but just experience. And, you know, I've seen a lot of things. I've done a lot of things, and I've performed a lot of in, in almost every venue you can imagine. And I have all of that experience, and I have all of those experiences to draw from and put into um, my vocals and into my guitar playing, because he is one of the greatest guitarists ever. It is an amazing album. It is just wonderful. The, the songs are amazing. Um, it, the song Luck and Strange is probably, I would think, it was an emotional song for them because the keyboard track on it was laid down in 2007 by Richard Wright, who was Pink Floyd's keyboardist. And of course, he passed away in 2008. And they brought, brought that forward and incorporated it into a song. And of course, the title song, Luck and Strange. And I had to imagine that that had to have been, there had to have been emotion there because you can, you can sense... In a lot of these tracks, I can sense a lot of emotion. The, the one, Yes, I Have Ghosts, which is a duet he does with his daughter, Romney. Oh, my goodness. I And I might be imagining it, but I don't care. Um, I get the sense you, when you listen to him singing and you just focus on it, you hear a very proud father. I'm getting emotional thinking about it. He's getting to sing with his daughter. She is 22. She's got this amazing voice. And you hear in her voice, she's performing with her dad. And it's a special, very, very special recording. You'll have to excuse me for a second. Well, thank you for letting me have a moment to compose myself. That album is a wonderful album, and I highly encourage you to give it a listen. Um, the next album I want to talk about is the most amazing prog rock album you've probably ever heard, Jade Warrior, The Way of the Sun. Now, this is an interesting band. This is from 1978, and it was never really a band. It was two guys and then a bunch of session musicians, but it was the most interesting prog rock band, I think, I've heard. Now, prog rock in this era in 1978, a lot of it to me was kind of rockified, electrified, sort of medieval, sort of kind of British music. Um, and it's wonderful, you know, Genesis and Camel and uh, Renaissance and, and Von der Graaff Generator. But, but they have kind of a similar sort of undercurrent theme running through them. And it's that kind of medieval sort of thing. This one is totally different. This is full on Latin, South American rhythms, themes, instrumentation, just amazing, wonderful. Definitely he's got that prog rock sense to it, that flavor to it, but it is so unique and so different. I mean, there's a track on it called Carnival. You'd swear, if you closed your eyes, you would think it was a Carlos Santana track. Just amazing. They do some of the most interesting thematic, rhythmic stuff in these. And the standouts are the uh, track Sun Ra and the Death of Ra. It's engaging. You've never heard anything like it, and it's going to make you want to go dive deep into the Jade Warrior catalog, and I promise you that will be a rewarding adventure for you. Just excellent. Uh, uh, again, Jade Warrior, the, the album uh, Way of the Sun. Now, the Fozzie Audio did something that no other Saber DAC has done for me, and that it's, it pulled me in. It engaged me. There's some secret sauce that Fazio has put in this thing, and I, it, it, I think it's a combination of a really well-designed uh, analog section and the ability to put some really good high-quality op amps in it. The stock op amps sounded very good. The, the, the extra pair that were supplied in the box when I got it, the JRCs, were good as well, but once I got into, you know, the Sparko sounded great out single-ended. Um, the OPA 1656s from TI sounded really good, but something happened when I put those SX52Bs I got from AliExpress in there. There was some synergy. There was something magic in my system, in, that, in, in this listening sessions that I did with it. There was just something happened that pulled me in and engaged me. Um, it... I, I've never had a Sabre DAC do that before. Um, and I've heard some other decent Sabre DACs, the 4018 Q2M or K2Ms, not bad, depends on the implementation. And again, I think with a lot of DACs, it depends on the implementation um, and it, not necessarily the chip, although I do think that ESS chips have a certain character. But in this case, whatever Fozzie did, whatever their engineers did, it, it absolutely outstanding. It's the best 
uh, saber chip based deck I've ever heard. And then when you roll the op amps, it is becomes it just takes it to another level. Uh, and again, those SX 52 B's just really did a great job. So being the first link in the chain, its job is to decode the ones and zeros and do it cleanly and accurately and get that sound out to the amp and the speakers. And most of my listening sessions were done with the Black Ice F 22 and the big uh, Wharfdales. It did a remarkable job in it. I think there's a little extra bass response baked into this, which I really, really like. I appreciate that a lot. It performed wonderfully. It gave me all of the sound. It gave me a rewarding listen. I never felt there was anything lacking. I thought when it came to imaging, it just, whatever the equipment laid, it gave a signal to the, the amp and the speakers to lay down a, amazing image. And it was, some of the imaging was great. Now, these are all studio albums. So all of the imaging is, is created in the studio. And of course the uh, Aretha Franklin album was recorded in the late 60s. So it's, you know, you got the backup singers in one channel and the drum in the other channel. So it's that odd 60s. They hadn't quite figured out the stereo mix yet. Sort of sound to it was still amazing and rewarding and wonderful. The David Gilmour, a much better recording, and Jade Warrior for 1978 is one of the most amazing recordings. And it was just so rewarding to listen to. You know, it did a great job with the bass. It did a great job with mid-range. It did a great job. Aretha's vocals were just so well rendered. Gilmour's vocals were just so well rendered and engaging. This did a really, really good job overall. I mean, I, I could nail down specifics, but so much of it depends on the quality of the recording and the quality of the rest of the chain, you know, for, for the reproduction of the sound. But... This did, like I said, it did something no other Sabre deck has ever done, and it pulled me in, and it made me, it basically said, you sit and listen, and you're going to listen for a long period of time, and I did, and it was great. Highly recommend it. I don't think there's another DAC from Topping or SMSL upwards of 300, 350 bucks that will sound as good as this. And you know, when you add in the fact that you can roll op amps into it, um, it really, really becomes a compelling, compelling product. Now, so glad I had a chance to listen to this. Anyway, the SM, uh, oh man, am I going to get shot? The Fuzzy Audio ZD3 uh, Balanced DAC Preamp. What a wonderful piece. I will try it out with the, the monos on my desktop, the little Fozzie monos as a preamp. I think that'll be great. I don't know if I'll, I may do a system update and mention that kind of stuff later on. Anyway, highly recommend at 179 bucks. I don't think you can go wrong with this at all. Anyway, that's that, the ZD3. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you will be willing to give me a like and a subscribe. And if you wish to support the channel and you're watching on a computer or your phone, a mobile device, there is a thank you button at the bottom of the video window. There is also a member, excuse me, membership link in the pinned comment and in the video description. There will be an affiliate link for this product in the pinned comment and in the video description. And if you choose to use it, I appreciate it a great deal. Um, it does help support the channel. There are also other affiliate links in the video description. You know the drill on those. Uh, my playlists are there. Please comment, let me know what you think. Are you looking for a deck? Are you into op amp swapping? Do you have maybe some op amp suggestions that I haven't mentioned? Because I've got a lot of different ones as you saw, but there's, you know, there's a limited amount of time that I can actually spend doing all of that. So if you guys roll swap op amps in maybe this uh, deck or something else, let me know what your results were. Let me know what, how you felt about it. Did you get a great sound? And maybe it's something I can duplicate and we can talk about later. I think I'm done with that. <laughs> My name's Ed Homewood. This is the Old Guy Hi-Fi channel. It's now your obligation to go and listen. And honestly, go listen to that David Gilmore uh, Luck and Strange album. It is wonderful. It is engaging. Um, I think you'll find it very, very rewarding. And let me know what you think in the comments. So please sit back, relax, listen to some really wonderful music. Enjoy the balance of your day. And I thank you so very much for your time. I hope you have a wonderful day.